Hello, my name is Bill Goebel. Today we're going to explain the origins of the SIL safe data limits. I've had a lot of questions about that. SIL safe data is a valuable resource, but I understand everyone wants to know how did you get the data? As a co founder of Exeter, I'm quite pleased to report that over the last 20 plus years, Exeter has grown to arguably the most recognized functional safety company in the world. We have offices in every key region. We think of ourselves as a knowledge company. We research incident reports and a lot of field failure reports. We take all that data, turn it into information, and we publish it in our white papers, in our books, and in our training courses. Exeter has three primary business groups, a system lifecycle services group, which is out working with owner operators in many different industries around the world. We have an engineering tools group, which creates engineering software focused on making the functional safety life cycle more effective, less costly, and more accurate. And lastly, we have a certification and assessment group, which has become one of the world's leading certification companies. In the engineering tools group, a suite of tools called Excellentia is available for systems level safety life cycle work HAZOP, SIL verification, LOPA, proof test, all the way to data collection in an operating plant. The engineering tools group also has a suite of tools called OEMX for those who develop devices for functional safety applications. The Exeter certification group has established certification schemes for both functional safety and for cybersecurity. And Exeter is fully accredited from the American National Accreditation Body. We were quite pleased that in 2015, the ARC Advisory Group discovered that Exeter had become the global leader in functional safety certifications. We're also a clear global leader in automation cybersecurity certifications. We are very lucky that we have performance-based functional safety standards. In retrospect, I have concluded that this ingenious method for managing risk is a great blessing from the past, and it was primarily based on ISA S8401 from 1996. The 61511 safety life cycle, for example, starts with a phase called analysis, and that's where a group of risk analysts take into consideration the inherent risk, the tolerable risk, and estimate how much risk reduction do I need? We don't want too much, we don't want too little. We want an optimal amount depending on each safety function. Then designers get to choose how to design the safety instrumented function, but there are performance metrics on evaluating how much risk reduction was achieved. And lastly, we must ask ourselves, how do we keep it safe? In the analysis phase, how much risk reduction do we need is often determined by a simple risk graph it's also determined by more sophisticated methods like layer of protection analysis, where we sit down and figure out how many independent protection layers exist. We take credit for those layers and we do a more accurate estimate of how much risk reduction do we need. For example, if there's an initiating event, a pressure control loop fails, and let's say that happens once every 20 years, that means the frequency is 0 0.05 events per year. Now we envision a safety instrumented function, but there is a pressure relief valve and there is a rupture disc. 
So one of the first things we do is estimate the inherent or look at the inherent risk, 0.05 events per year, compare it to the tolerable risk. Oh boy, we've got to reduce that risk quite a bit. That's one times 10 to the minus six. Okay, no problem. But first, I want to give credit for my pressure relief valve and my rupture disc. Each is given a credit of 10 uh, and very conventional approach. And that gets the frequency to 0 0.0005. Hmm, we have a ways to go. So we've answered the question, do you need a safety instrumented function? The answer is yes. How much risk reduction do we need? Well, we can quickly calculate that we need a risk reduction of 500 to get down to the tolerable risk criteria. So we'll specify a risk reduction of 550 just to give a little extra safety margin. That's how much risk we need in a safety function design. Now, the next step is a control system designer will design an instrumented function with typically a sensor, some kind of logic solver and a final element to achieve a risk reduction of 550 or less. Objective's very clear. We need this much. We've got to equal or exceed that in terms of risk reduction. And the performance metrics that are used in our functional safety standards are right here, but the one we're going to focus on today is the risk reduction factor. And it's arguably the, uh, the hardest one to meet. There are a number of variables in a good risk reduction factor calculation, but most agree that the failure rates of the devices are the most important input variable to this calculation. The engineer performing this, this checking, this verification, has a great responsibility to ethically do a realistic job on this task. Any person performing SIF verification calculations must verify that the given failure rate data is intended for the application, includes all real failures, and matches the site operation and maintenance capability. Well, what are you talking about? Site operation maintenance capability. Exeter calls that the site safety index. There are several white papers on that subject and an evaluation tool on the Exeter website. Well, if it's really important that we get realistic failure rate data, where do we get it? As many of you know from looking at our webinars and reading our papers and books, there are many different methods for generating failure rate data. Therefore, and, and many of these methods have orders of magnitude differences. Therefore, it's essential that all given failure rate data be, be vetted and checked. So how do we check? That's what a tool called SIL Safe Data is for. Exeter received a lot of requests for some way to help engineers vet and check their data. We created SILSAFE data several years ago with a number of techniques, and we're going to talk about the origin of those techniques and the data produced. In the end, for any given device type, we have an upper bound and a lower bound. If you are given failure rate data, we expect that number to be between these two limits. If it isn't, Further investigation is, and justification is clearly required. We have a number of different types of sensors, logic solver devices, and even final element devices. And for each device in different applications, there's a lower bound and an upper bound on the dangerous undetected failure rate. I don't believe you. Where did you get this data? Well, I'll explain. Over many years, Exeter has accumulated over 400 billion unit operating hours of field failure data. Some of it is from manufacturers, some of it is directly from end users, and some of it is, some of it is from industry databases. Uh, we primarily use the ARETA database. 
So we take Orita chemical industry data, power industry data, and pipeline data, and we calculate upper and lower bounds with a 70% or a 90% confidence factor, depending on the quality of the data. That's the first thing that we use to establish our upper and lower bound limits. Then, of course, we take that same failure rate data and use it to generate a component reliability database and the site safety index mathematical models. It all comes from field failure rate data. The component reliability database is used to do failure mode effect and diagnostic analysis on devices. At this point, we've done hundreds of FMEDAs on devices like pressure sensors, temperature sensors, valves, actuators, logic solvers. And there are some variations in these designs. Not everybody designs the same product. We take into account the materials used compared to the environment and application. We take into account the design margins and the design techniques. We take into account the technology and stress protection built into a design. The better the materials, the higher the design margins, the better the component selection, the technology used, and the stress protection, the lower the failure rates. So if given several hundred FMEDAs on a particular type of product, like pressure transmitter, you will see a statistical variation. And ironically, it was very much a bell-shaped curve. Statistical analysis has been done on hundreds of FMEDAs, many of them per device type, and that also gives us some indication as to what the upper and lower bounds should be. So we take all this information and establish an upper bound and a lower bound for the dangerous undetected failure rates, ultimately based on a foundation of field failure data based on a safety site safety index model, and lastly, based on statistical analysis of the calibrated FMEDAs that were based on field failure data. This takes into account device design variations, environmental operating condition variations, and application variations. Bottom line is, SILSAFE data provides a means to check the applicability of any given failure rate data. Why check realistic data is needed to achieve realistic risk reduction in a SIF. If you need more information, a lot of our research has been written up in white papers uh, in our books, and of course, the information is provided in our training courses. Here are some of the most relevant uh, white papers from the Exeter website. Thank you for your time. We hope you found the information valuable. I hope you have a lot of confidence in using SILSAFE data. Just remember, if you get a piece of data that's outside the limits, something might be wrong and a just study and further justification is absolutely required.